Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Alpine Chapel's Church Online. My name is Kate, and we're so glad that you have joined us today. We hope that you had an amazing weekend so far. Today is going to be a great morning. In just a few minutes, we're going to take time to worship. And maybe that seems difficult to do with all that's going on around you this morning, especially if you've got Alpine kids at home. We get it. It's challenging. But in these next moments, while our team leads us, take time to maybe just pray. Be still and ask God to meet you right where you are. Ask that his voice speaks clearly to you today. We are believing that God is going to do great things right here in your home. So once again, thanks so much for joining us, and we hope you have a great morning.
God, today, this is a grateful people. Grateful that we are marked by freedom. Grateful that we can leave our grave behind. Grateful that our hope is not found in our own human strength, because that'll never be enough, but it's found in you, Jesus. Our living hope, who will sustain us every day. That's what we sing today. Oh, how great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into
these songs, whether they're filling your living room or your backyard or your car stereo today, are all amazing reminders of not just the magnificence of our God, not just the saving power of our God, but the ability of our God. And in a, in a day and age where it seems even the church and even God's people are struggling to figure out where to fix their eyes, we still hold to this psalm that says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. In an age where we're so quick to trust the next thing that hits our news feed, or network news, <laughs> or a high school friend from Facebook, whatever they say is, you know, the right way. <laughs> We're so easy to put our eyes into the places that don't offer living hope. But today we come, regardless of where you're at, like I said, if you're at your house, just standing here right now, we come and we lift our eyes up to the hills and the presence of the living hope, the living hope, Jesus, who sustains us, who watches over us and who will always be our help because he alone is able to preserve his people, to look upon his people in favor. And in the form of just gracious gift, after gracious gift, we get to receive life. And so we gather in these places to proclaim the worth and the honor and our gratitude and our joy that we have in our Father alone. Today, God, I pray that we would learn to take our eyes off of the hopes of the world and fix our eyes on the living hope. the one who stays stable, stays firm beneath our feet, even in the moments um, where it seems like all hope is lost. When the dark has set in and the light will never prevail. Today, God, wherever we are, we fix our eyes upon you. As we sing this today, would you let it be a reminder to our hearts to come back to you and look up. Fix our eyes on you, God. We believe you're worthy. We believe you've not yet even spoken the most life and freedom that we'll ever hear. So we sing today. Oh, do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the lie from getting through we do and do you wish that you could see it all made new we do it's all creation grown in it is and is a new creation come promise of hope. And is the glory of the Lord to be the lion within our midst? It is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Oh, is anyone worthy? Is anyone 
declare as a church. thank you for the reminder that the one who sits among us today is the one who is able, is the one who is worthy, is the one who will never forsake his people. Lord, we talk all the time about how you are our hope. And we define that as a competent expectation of that coming good ahead of us because we believe that your character and your promises are trustworthy. And so today, not because of anything we've done, not because of anything we've earned, you still offer your whole self to us. And for that, we say thank you, we are grateful, and we believe that you are worthy. To you be the honor and glory forever and evermore. Amen. We are so thankful for the team that leads us in worship every week, reminding us of who God is and what he's done. And in just a moment, we're going to continue in worship by giving. But first, we just want to say a special thanks to those who are joining us for the first time. If you're new to Alpine, we would love to say hey, connect with you, and even give you a small gift just to say thanks for being with us. Just text ACLZ to 97000, follow the link, and we will get that gift sent out to you. We want you to know that when you give here at Alpine, you're doing way more than just keeping the lights on or keeping our live stream up and running. You're joining God on his mission to bring hope. And we just want to say thanks. Thank you for faithfully giving and being part of sharing hope with our community. If you want to give today, you can follow the easy and secure ways to give on screen or follow the instructions provided by your service host in the chat. Once again, thank you for your generosity. Well, we had another amazing Wednesday night outdoor gathering this past week as we got to watch our families and kids in Family Olympics. In fact, if you are looking for an in-person gathering, we want to invite you to this week's water night on Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m. It's guaranteed to make a big splash. See what I did there? Anyways, no registrations, no fees, just show up and enjoy community, food, games, and live music. Plus, this week will be extra special as we will be doing outdoor water baptisms. You're not going to want to miss this. We hope to see you there. Well, today we continue our series on Asking for a Friend where we will get to explore and discuss what God's word has to say about those questions that show up in our everyday lives. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Alpine Chapel's Church Online. My name is Alex Gowler. I'm the spiritual formation pastor here at Alpine. And so glad that you could join us for part four of our series, Asking for a Friend. We've been taking the past few weeks to respond to the questions that matter to you. And so right off the bat, we want to say thank you to everybody who took the time to send in your questions and trust us with things that matter to you. Today, we are going to be talking about a question that quite a few of you brought up and is a question that's especially important for the times that we're living in now, but has been important since Jesus walked this earth. We're going to take the time to talk about that question, but before we do, we're also going to take some time to share a tool with all of you that can help you respond to questions that people ask you. So we're going to introduce a framework that you can use to respond to questions that people ask you, and then we're going to actually use that framework to respond to a question that you asked us. So I don't know about you or what your experience has been, but questions can be really tricky things because sometimes the words that people use are different from the question they're actually asking. And if you want to give a meaningful response to someone, 
what you need to do is figure out the question that they're really asking and determine where the question is actually coming from. Because different questions come from different places and require different responses. Now, let me tell you a story about how I learned this the hard way. So it was about eight years ago, and I was working nights and weekends at a chain coffee shop in my hometown. And because I was working nights, working afternoons and weekends, that's usually when things are a little bit less busy, and you have more time to talk and get to know the people that are on your team. And one of the people that was on my team, we'll call her Amber. Amber is one of those people that has the perfect coffee shop personality. She was artistic, she was bubbly and friendly, and at this time in my life, I was tr trying very hard to be that kind of person. That works kind of when you're on the afternoon shift and when you're on the evening shift, not so much at 5 a.m. when people are rolling through the drive-thru and you're like, hello and welcome to coffee shop, how can I help you? And the response is, you can stop first and then you can coffee me because coffee is helpful and not whatever that was. Not asking for a friend, speaking from experience. Anyway. So Amber did this naturally, and she was very energetic, great personality, perfect coffee shop, whatever. And in this particular season, that was all kind of dialed up a little bit because Amber had a new boyfriend. But there was one day that Amber came into the coffee shop to start her shift, and I was the shift supervisor at that time, and you could tell that something was just a little off. And Amber was not her usually joyful, energetic self. There was a cloud over that friendliness and that joy today, but I'm shift supervisor and we got to get stuff done and we got tasks to do. So I'm like, okay, whatever, she'll get over it. And so we start the shift and we're going about our stuff. And at a certain point, I'm standing at the counter and Amber's doing her tasks and she asks a question. She says, Alex, do you think it's really true that you always hurt the ones you love? Now I'm going to request that you guys don't judge me for what happens next. I'm also not going to blame you if you do, because it's bad. <laughs> so Amber, happy Amber, bubbly Amber, now cloudy Amber, sad Amber, just started dating someone Amber, asked me the question, Alex, do you, do you think it's true that you always hurt the ones you love? My response, verbatim. Well, I mean, let's say that even the best people uh, hurt people sometimes, okay? So like, on accident. Let's say that's one out of every, every 20 interactions, okay? So if you take that ratio and you make the, this is verbatim, you make the assumption that you interact more with the people that you love than the people that you don't, and you have more opportunity to hurt them. So I guess you'd have to say that like, yeah, that's, that's a really true statement that you do kind of always hurt the people that you love. That was my response, Amber's response, silence. Which in case you're wondering is not a good sign. So I, and there's two types of people that are listening to this right now. There's the type of people that are going like, are you serious? You missed this young woman in distress? And there's another group of people that's like, that's actually a really solid answer. Like the logic on that is, is, is pretty tight. And I thought it was too, until she didn't respond. And I'm like, what's going on? This is weird. Well, come to find out. A couple hours later, here's what happens. I'm, I'm standing, I'm standing at the point of sale at the cash register, kind of watching things play out. Amber's at the other end of the counter. And in walks Amber's boyfriend. He throws open the door to the cafe, carrying a bouquet of flowers. Their eyes meet from across the coffee shop, and Amber drops her gaze and blushes, and, and, and he, he glides through the coffee shop, and the birds are singing, and the music is swelling, and, and he walks up to the counter, and he, and he places the bouquet, and he looks her in the eyes, and who knew that you could say so much by saying so little? And I'm, I'm standing at the cash register watching this Hallmark moment play out. And it's in that moment that I realize, oh no, I have made a critical error in my response to Amber. I was responding to her words and not to the question she was actually asking. I didn't know where the question was coming from, and so I gave a response that wasn't appropriate, and if I had just taken the time to figure out what was going on behind the question, I could have given an answer that was actually meaningful. <laughs> and that's where this all started for me, of discovering that different questions come from different places and require different responses. And so if you want to give a meaningful response to the people in your life, to the questions that they ask, it's on you to figure out where those questions are coming from. 
And so I've been taking the past eight years to try and be a really good listener to the questions that people are actually asking, to the point where it's annoying to some people, because rarely will I give a straight answer to a question. It's usually answering with a question, and that like ticks people off sometimes. But in order to give a meaningful response to the questions that people ask, we need to know where those questions are coming from. I would make the argument that every question that you're asked, this has been my experience, it may be true for your experience as well, every question that you're gonna be asked will come from one of three places. Curiosity, confusion, or concern. And depending on where the question is coming from, each of those places requires a different kind of response. So let's talk about the first place that a question can come from, and that's the place of curiosity. Curiosity questions are all about conversation. These are the questions that people ask when they just want to talk. They just want to exchange ideas and have a discussion with you. These are the questions that we ask for small talk, chit chat. Hey, where are you from? Where'd you go to school? Or, or icebreaker questions like, do you think that a hot dog is a sandwich? Or if you're following Alpine Youth, they recently released a video where they go around Lake Zurich asking total strangers, would you rather have feet for hands or hands for feet? Interesting conversation, but here's the thing. Your answer to curiosity questions probably won't change your life, unless you're one of those people that really needs to know if a hot dog is, is a sandwich. In that case, we love you, God bless you, and we are praying for you. <laughs> but your answer to curiosity questions isn't gonna change the trajectory of your life. They're just questions that people wanna start a conversation. That's the first place that questions could come from is a place of curiosity. The second place that questions can come from is a place of confusion and confusion questions are all about clarity. These are the questions when people asking, when people are asking, it's usually because they're getting conflicting messages and they wanna know what's best or what's right. What translation of the Bible should I really be using? Should I water my plants in the morning or at night? Is coffee really good for you? These are the questions, I just heard a, a yes, that was great. These are the questions that people ask when they're wondering what is best and what is right. People are looking for clarity when they're asking these kind of conversations, or when they're asking these kind of questions. So the questions can come from a place of curiosity, a place of confusion. The third place that questions can come from is a place of concern. And these questions are all about care. People ask these questions when there's things going on in their life, issues or problems that they want to talk about with someone, but they're not exactly sure how to start the conversation. And what people need more than anything else when they're asking these questions that come from a place of concern is care. They need time, they need attention, they need somebody to listen. Because people aren't looking for great responses when they're asking these kind of questions, they're looking for great listeners. And so if we're gonna give a meaningful response to people who ask questions to us in our life, it's on us to figure out where those questions are coming from. Are they curiosity questions? Are they confusion questions, or are they places that they're asking this question from that are from a deep place of concern? And the easiest way to do this is to just ask. A lot of times when people ask me questions that I can't figure out where they're coming from, I'll say, hey, that's, that's a great question, and I wanna give you a great response. Something that would help me do that is to know where that question is coming from. Is this just something you're curious about? Is this a concern for you, or is there a little bit of confusion going on for this? When you ask someone where a question is coming from, it gives them the opportunity to tell you what kind of response they're looking for. Because when people are asking curiosity questions, they're just looking for a conversation. You get to give your perspective and then invite theirs because they're looking for an exchange of ideas. Personally, I don't think a hot dog is a sandwich, though you have a very strong argument when you consider the submarine sandwich. What do you think? You're inviting a conversation. That's what people are looking for. When people are asking questions from a confused place, what they're looking for is clarity. And this is kind of a tricky place for you to be if you're being asked a question. Because odds are good when people are asking you this question, it's because they consider you an expert or someone with some authority or something to offer to this particular situation. They care about your opinion. And so it's on us when we're asked those questions to be very careful in our response, especially if we have some expertise in a certain area we are offered to give our humble perspective, to say, hey, this is what I know, and this is what I don't. Here's what I think, but other people will think differently. So you can give your response, but give it with humility, acknowledging that there's other responses and other clarity that people are looking for. 
But your answer is not the end-all be-all, but you can still give a meaningful response to someone who asks a question from a confused place. Now, when people are asking questions from a concerned place, more often than not, what they need for you, from you more than a great answer or to know what's right or just for you to talk to them is for you to listen. And they want to talk about the thing that's driving that question. And so for you to ask good questions back, to give them the time and attention and the care that they need when they're asking this question, that allows you to give a meaningful response to them that's based less on the words that you say and more about the tone that you're setting for the conversation. And this is a perfect time to put into practice what we talked about last week with Jeremy Pettit and what does it mean to be a good listener and being able to hear them out, discover where they're coming from and give them what they're really looking for. Because different questions come from different places and require different responses. You can use this framework in the questions that people ask you in your daily life, and we're gonna use this framework this morning to talk about one of the questions that you asked us. Now, the question that you asked, uh, quite a few of you asked it, actually, and it's a question that's been important to followers of Jesus since he was walking the earth and is still important today. And it's a conversation that we need to have. And the question is this, are we, living in the end times. We're going to go there. This is a conversation that's worth happening or that's worth having in this season. Are we living in the end times? And for those of you that may be new to following Jesus or you're tuning in and you're just kind of curious about this whole God, church, Christianity thing, there's a set of beliefs that we have about who Jesus is and what he's promised to do that we consider to be central or core to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We believe that Jesus is God, that he came to earth and became human. He became one of us. He died on a cross as one of us, as a human. He came back to life, and one day he's coming back to establish God's kingdom on earth fully, finally, and forever. And this idea is based off of teachings from Jesus himself in places like Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation, where the author of the book of Revelation says in chapter one, verse one, that this is a revelation from Jesus Christ. This is an opportunity to get a heavenly perspective on earthly events. That song that we sang earlier, He is Worthy, a lot of the language and the imagery that that song uses is actually taken from the book of Revelation. And we use that to talk about what Jesus has promised. And by all accounts, when you look at the teachings of Jesus and looking to scripture as our guide, we see that the period of time leading up to Jesus's return is a period of time in which the entire world kind of unravels into this state of total chaos. And there are nations fighting other nations at a unprecedented scale. There's, there's natural disasters. There's weird things happening in the heavens. And there are God's people being persecuted all over the world. And there's this sort of crescendo of chaos that builds and builds and builds until Jesus steps in to bring back God's order, his justice, his goodness, and set all things right. And as followers of Jesus, we believe in what Jesus said. We take scripture as our guide and we look to this promise of Jesus that he is coming back. But it sounds like things are gonna get really, really crazy and chaotic and out of control before that happens. And so in this season, when things feel very chaotic in our personal lives, at a national level, at a global level, when there seems to be chaos and we don't really know what's going to happen next, people are asking this question, are we living in the end times? Are we living in that crescendo of chaos towards when Jesus comes back? And so we're gonna take that question and we're actually gonna run it through our filter. How do we respond to this question when it comes from a place of curiosity? How do we respond when it comes from a place of confusion? And how do we respond when it comes from a place of concern? Here's what's interesting. I have never, and this may be true for your experience, I have never had to respond or talk about this question, are we living in the end times, when things are going well? 
This is not a question that people ask when like life is good and things are great. It's not like, hey, how are you doing? Man, I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. My family's healthy. My job's good. I maxed out my RR, uh, Roth IRA contributions this year. I mean, I'm really happy about national politics and the geopolitical landscape. Like things are just going great. Do you think Jesus is coming back? <laughs> like that, I've never had that conversation. That is never the tone that this question is asked in. The only time that most people think about this question or ask this question is when things feel chaotic, not just in their personal lives, but in a cultural, national, or global scale. When things feel chaotic and uncertain and out of control, that's when this question really gets brought up. And so this question, are we living in the end times, almost never comes from a place of pure curiosity. So we can't give a response to the question coming from that place because it never comes from that place. But it's important for us to know that the tone and the environment and the atmosphere that this question is asked in is usually charged with uncertainty and feeling out of control and not sure what happens next. So what if this question comes from a confused place? And that's probably more true for a lot of people who ask this question because there's a lot of conflicting messages out there. And there have been for a long time time. So what does scripture, and specifically what does Jesus, have to say about this question, are we living in the end times? If you have a Bible with you, or if you can open it up on your browser, go to Acts 1, verse 6 to 11. We're looking at the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 to 11, and this is the last recorded conversation we have with Jesus and his 12 disciples. It's his last words, his final charge to them before he ascends into heaven. And so we have this recorded for us in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 11. It says, Then they, the disciples, gathered around him, Jesus, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's their version of the question. Is this the end times? Like, are you coming back to wrap this thing up and put us back in charge and make all things right again? At this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus' response, verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. This is the last conversation that we have between Jesus and his disciples, where he answers in response to this question, are we living in the end times? And so we offer a humble perspective, knowing that there are lots of opinions on this particular issue and that we would do well to figure out and have conversation with one another about this topic because there's a lot of confusion out there. Here's a perspective that we can offer. Students of scripture and students of history, taking scripture as our guide and Jesus at his word, An answer that we would give to this question, are we living in the end times, is both yes and maybe. Yes and maybe. What do we mean by that? If the question that's being asked is, are we living in the period of time between when Jesus left and when he's coming back, then the answer obviously is (laughs) yes. Here's the thing. Jesus gives us an unexpected gift in Acts 1, verses 6 to 11. What the disciples are looking for when they ask this question about when he's coming back is certainty. They want a date and a time associated with when he's coming back. Jesus doesn't give them certainty. He gives them clarity. He says, basically, it's none of your business to know. When I'm coming back, here's what you do need to know. You will receive power by the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses to everyone 
everywhere. So go. In this period of time between when Jesus left and when he's coming back, you look at other places in scripture where Jesus teaches that we will not know the time or the day that he's coming back, but we are to live with a sense of eager expectation and anticipation that he is returning. In the meanwhile, we are given the marching orders to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and to bear witness to the person and work of Jesus with the words we say, the things we do, and who we are together. Jesus doesn't give us certainty about his return, but he gives us clarity of what we're to do in this in-between time. And so to the question, are we living in the end times? Are we living in this in-between period where Jesus has given us clear instruction of what to do while we wait for his return? Then, the, then our answer is yes, absolutely. But that's not the question that people are really asking. The question that people are asking is, are we living through the final few scenes of this chapter of human history? Like, is this the Avengers endgame of the human story? Like, are we about to wrap this whole segment up? And to that, the answer that we have to give is maybe, maybe. Here is the interesting, beautiful, frustrating thing about what Jesus teaches us in scripture about his return. There is not enough detail for us to pin down when exactly he's coming back, but there is just enough detail for every single generation that has ever lived since his ascension to think to themselves, could this be it? And we have to trust the character and promises of God that that's on purpose. Yep. That if God is a good father and Jesus is good because he reflects that character of God, then if it was good for us to know the exact time that he was coming back, he would have let us know, but he didn't. And so we have to conclude that it's good for us, and we need to live in this sense of eager anticipation of Jesus' return while trying to manage the things that are going on in the times and places that we find ourselves uniquely in history. What we can't do is check out and believe that Jesus isn't coming back or go the opposite direction and try to put a timestamp on the date and time of his return. This has not gone well within the history of the church. Because if you think about it, every single prediction thus far of the return of Jesus has been wrong. Because we're still here. <laughs> so let's just, let's just go through real quick a catalog of unfulfilled predictions of Jesus' return. Just to give a sense of scope for this. Ready? So Irenaeus. One of the early church fathers, early centuries of the church, critical in forming what we believe to be Christian orthodoxy today and for all churches every year. Irenaeus predicted that Jesus would come back in the 6th century. We're still here. Pope Sylvester II of the Roman Catholic Church, the highest authority within the Roman Catholic Church, said that Jesus was coming back in the year 1000. The Anabaptists the Anglican Church of England, and the Lutheran denomination all said that Jesus was coming back in the 1500s. John Wesley, founder of the Wesleyan Church Movement and the Methodist Church, he and his brother Charles wrote hymns that are still sung all over the world by followers of Jesus. John predicted that Jesus would come back in the year 1836. The Assemblies of God denomination said that Jesus would coming back during World War I. And this is one of my favorites. Edgar C. Wisenot, a former NASA engineer turned Bible student, said that Jesus would coming back in the year 1988, and then 1989, and then 1993, and then 1994. Wrong, 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 wrong. People predicted that the formation of the nation state of Israel was the start of the end times. And then the formation of the European Union. And then... Y2K, and then the war in Afghanistan, and then the rise of Islam and ISIS, and then the year 2020. Ta-da! <laughs> and so people are caught in this idea that we can somehow work against the teachings of Jesus when Jesus said, it's none of your business to know when I'm coming back, to say, no, we can decide when you're coming back, and we can put a timestamp on that. You have better odds at this point of winning the lottery, being struck by lightning, or predicting the weather in Illinois. 
than you do predicting the return. Like that's saying something. And so for us to think that we can work against the teachings of Jesus and try to put a timestamp on his return is missing the point completely. Because Jesus said that what we needed to know wasn't the time and date of his return, but the fact that he was coming back. And in the meanwhile, there was work to do. And that work begins when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, trusting Jesus in community and moving into this world that is chaotic, that is crazy, that is feeling out of control right now. And instead of being messengers of more destruction and chaos, we are messengers of hope. To say that God is who he says he is, that he is still in control, and that we have a confident expectation of a better tomorrow that is based on who God is and what he said he will do. Those are our marching orders. Now, regardless of whether Jesus comes back in a minute or a month or a hundred years from now, our mission has not changed. To bear witness to the good news of Jesus with what we say and what we do and who we are together. So are we living in the end times? Yes, and maybe. Regardless, our mission has not changed, to be messengers of hope together. And that's a perspective that we bring to this question when there is a lot of confusion out there right now. But there's another place that this question can come from that requires an even deeper response. When this question comes from a place of concern, People asking this question, again, this question is never asked out of pure curiosity. It's asked when people feel out of control, when things feel unpredictable, when things feel uncertain, and we don't have the answers that we're looking for. And at this point, what would be ideal is for all of us just to be able to sit down and talk about this. What are you feeling? What's going on? When you think about this question, what's driving that? And Lord willing, you guys are doing that in community because that's what we want you to be able to do because that's where you're going to find what you need in this season of people to listen and care. Here's what I've found in my conversations with people about this question so far in this particular season. In almost every single case, that uncertainty, the anxiety, and that feeling of helplessness that is often loaded into this question, are we living in the end times, is all driven by fear of the unknown. We don't know what this fall is gonna look like. We don't know what's gonna happen to the economy. We don't know where the global scene is going. We don't know what's going to happen with politics this November. We just don't know. And that feeling of being out of control and uncertain causes people to have this anxiety and this fear. And what we wanna do is medicate with information. And we think that we can fix this fear with data. And again, if we are looking to scripture as our guide, scripture doesn't tell us that perfect data drives out fear. It tells us that perfect love drives out fear. And what we need is not more information. What we need is deeper intimacy with who God is and what he says he'll do. The invitation that we have in this season, and if you're watching this, and you have that sense of anxiety or helplessness or whatever that's kind of driving you to ask this question and this frantic search for, for, for data and charts and graphs and how can we figure this out? Because if we just figure it out, then the fear will go away. A, that's not true. B, the invitation to you is an invitation into a deeper understanding of who God is and what he has said he'll do. Because it's from that place that we have that confident expectation of a better tomorrow even when things look uncertain, even when things feel out of control, even when we don't know what happens next, we know who is still in control and we know who we are. We are children of God, dearly loved, who he has promised he will never abandon, forsake, or leave to our own devices because he loves us. And so the invitation to you is to grow in your understanding of who God is and what he said he will do. And from that place, have that confident expectation of a better tomorrow and not do that by yourself, to do that with your community and with your church because we are doing this together. Jesus knew we needed this for each other. We needed each other in this conversation. And so he left us with each other. And so if the question comes from that place of concern and that fear is what's driving it, 
that fear is transformed into an eager anticipation when we know who it is that's coming back. The when isn't so much as important as the who. And so when we press into that, we can have that confident expectation of a better tomorrow based on the character and promises of God. And so wherever this question comes for you today, here's what we can be sure of. Jesus isn't here. He left and said he was coming back. But between now and then, he has given us clear instructions of how to move forward. What I love about the story that we read earlier about Jesus's last interactions with his disciples in Acts 1, 6 to 11, is you get this sense that Jesus leaves and the disciples are just kind of standing there, just watching him ascend into heaven. And then these two angels show up and they're like, guys, hey, what are you doing? He, he said he was going to leave, which he just did. And he said he's coming back. Stop looking into the sky because we got work to do. Go, go back to Jerusalem, pray for the Holy Spirit, and then get ready for the mission that God has for you. And we cannot spend our time staring into the sky, wondering, is this it? Is this it? Is this it? Do we need to be watchful? Absolutely. Do we need to anticipate his return? Absolutely. Do we need to live on mission? Absolutely. We have the confident expectation that Jesus said he's coming back, and he will. And between now and then, we get to be messengers of hope together. And so we're looking forward to sharing more of that mission together as a church in the days and weeks and months ahead, because this is what Jesus has called us to. We're so happy that you decided to join us today for the last part of our series, Asking for a Friend. And we're praying for you and the questions that you're asked this week and the conversations that you'll have with the people in your life. And we'd love to pray right now for all of that. Can we do that? Jesus, we are so grateful that you know us, that you love us, and you have given us everything that we need. You have promised that you are coming back and you have been very clear on what we're to do in the meanwhile. And so we pray for all of the conversations and the questions that will happen in our lives in the coming weeks, that you would help us to hear your voice clearly and that you would give us the courage to do absolutely anything and everything that you would call us to do in the days and weeks and months ahead. No matter how crazy things get, we know that you are good and that you are in control, that you love us and that we are yours. And it's in the power of those truths that we go to be your witnesses to everyone, everywhere. We love you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And parents, have your kids check out our latest episode of Alpine Kids on our website for their chance to win a $50 gift card. I hope you all had an amazing morning, and we will see you next week. <laughs>